This four-armed, gender-swapped orc is not real Warhammer. This is a bootleg, a recast, and clearly made by a degenerate. Let me show you how I did it. 40k Skaven, Space Skaven, Space Rats, Games Workshop isn't making them, I guess I have too. And let's imbue our model with a bit of magic by choosing really cool parts. This body is made from a 1989 Space Orc from the very first plastic Space Orc kit. And these rat bits are from the Mordheim box. And I'm leaving all the grime that this model has accumulated. All the paint, all the glue chunks, all the chips, the mold lines. Why? Because all the crust is funny to me. Because it's sort of like the antithesis of Games Workshop. And that really tickles some sort of like wanky art part of my brain. And with a bit of sculpting work, this is my space rat, complete with a mohawk, because all the best models have mohawks. Okay, so we've created a kit bash now. There's nothing dodgy about that, but in order to create a bootleg, we've got to mold and cast it. This is the point of no return, and the theory is pretty simple. To make a copy of a miniature, you pour liquid rubber around it, it hardens, and then you have a mold. You remove the miniature from the mold, and in the void, pour liquid resin, and in just a few moments, you'll have a copy, a cast. That is molding and casting, and it really can be that simple. That's how I made copies of my toads I sculpted a couple of years ago. But for more complex models, we've got to consult the masters. That led me to Nottingham, home of Warhammer. And the art of molding and casting miniatures is one sort of spoken in whispers. Unless... You're friends with Curtis. Curtis is an expert molder and caster working in ramshackle games out of Nottingham and he very kindly took me under his wing for a week to learn his secrets. The model we want to cast is put on a sprue or a base. This will make casting easier later on. And if Curtis taught me anything, it's make your sprues cool. Make them useful. Because so many sprues just end up in landfill, you might as well make them into something. In places where air might get trapped when the liquid resin is poured in, rod is used to make a path for the air to travel, and that way our model will hopefully come out bubble free. Eventually our model will have to be cut out of the mold because it's too complex to be removed in one piece. So I'm using a pen to mark where I would like my cut to be. This is where the two halves of the mold will connect. The model is then boxed up with lots and lots of tape ready for silicon. Curtis and I have similar but different tools and materials, so when I came back to Australia I had to spend a lot of time trying to adapt what I would learned into a workflow that works for me. Let's make a mould. This silicon is fast setting. We have about 6 minutes when we start mixing. My mixing pot is also my comically small vacuum chamber which we use to suck out as many bubbles as we can from the silicon. If you underestimated how much silicon you might need, don't mix more now. You don't have time, but you can add silicon when it's cured later. Now, we add pressure using a pressure pot. This is a homemade pot, and making your own is a bit of a rite of passage. Mine, and just about everyone else's, is made from a painter's pressure pot. Air goes in here from the compressor. This gauge tells me exactly how much pressure has been built up. And this, the most important bit, is the safety blow off valve, which stops my pot from turning into an explosive if I accidentally add too much air. This is me and my friend Tone, testing his homemade pressure pot for the first time. He made it and my limbs and I tested it. That's friendship. A pressure pot is used to make any bubbles that still might be in the silicon teeny tiny. This is good for silicons with a short working time that you might struggle to degas entirely before it starts to cure. Now this is a mold that I made with Curtis and we didn't pressurize it, it turned out perfectly, but this is a long setting silicon. This took like 24 hours to cure. This is also a silicon that takes 24 hours to cure, but it had expired and we had like five minutes working time basically and we couldn't remove all the bubbles. As a result, all the surface of this face has all these little micro bubbles on there and then when you mold and cast it, your cast will have all these warts on it. But Tone and I discovered when we only had access to expired silicon, if you put it in the pressure pot, even if you can't degas it all in time before it starts curing, it will come out as a perfect mold.
After waiting half an hour, this is where the art begins. We gotta cut the model out. Curtis has shown me this process many times and I really didn't understand it until I had the knife in my hands and I had to do it myself. And I suspect you'll probably be the same. Break off the sprue and now it's time to cut. Start cutting where you drew your lines and try your best to follow them around. It's tricky and Curtis is a god and can do all sorts of complex models this way. I specifically have been using very simple models to try to make this process as straightforward as I can. And once the model is free, you can cast. I use a fast setting polyurethane, so I can cram in as many models into my day as I can. Fast setting also means a very short working time, even shorter if your environment is warm. That's why Curtis stores all his resin in the fridge. As soon as you mix, we gotta go. Spread open your mold and pour. This will get the resin to the bottom of the mold much faster. Then squeeze the mold together and immediately throw it in the vacuum chamber. I mold and cast several models all at the same time. It's much more efficient, but it's also chaos. Then suck. While it's bubbling away, I check the leftover resin in the cup. And as soon as it's starting to get really thick, I turn off the vacuum and throw the whole thing into the pressure pot. And just like magic, 20 minutes later, we have a model. Now I've been casting my models in pink as a bit of a homage to my favorite bootleg artist, the Suck Lord, but also because I think it's really funny because Games Workshop could never, ever, ever cast their models in pink. So this bootleg journey sort of started as a satirical way to document significant moments in miniature culture. Stuff that people get angry about and then quickly forget. I thought it'd be fun to sort of document that. And this is a Wizard of the Coast I made for the open game license saga. And this is Presentor, Games Workshop's new host that can never leave, uh, unlike the others have. This bootlegging thing has been sort of like a reflection of my hobby. What I consider to be art, what I don't. When I think about kit bashes, I consider that to be an art form, like collage. My kit bashes have sold for lots of money, and when I see brewing kit bashes out in the world, sometimes it makes me change how I see everything. If I turn that kit bash into a bootleg model, if I recast that, I think I'm breaking some laws. So I guess the question is whether I care or not. And I don't know. Because for me, I've been choosing miniatures that I feel like they don't belong to Games Workshop anymore. It's not like I'm picking off new models off the shelf and recasting them for my own personal gain, necessarily. For me, doing this, this model is a HeroQuest Sorcerer, which is an icon. And the head is a second edition Orc. Both of these things, I think, are bigger than Games Workshop. They're bigger than Warhammer, they're bigger than the community itself. They are just part of culture now, in my opinion. So for me, this feels like fair game. I know a lawyer would disagree. So I guess, I think ethically, I think, you know, if I had a bunch of these in my backpack, would I be okay selling them at a convention? I don't know. But if you see me at a convention, maybe you should ask. But before this, I was experimenting with AI, and I asked it to design a demon prince for me. I used Nurgle as a keyword, and what I got back didn't entirely scream Nurgle, but it was cool, so I made something inspired by it. And in the back of my head, I knew this model had been designed by an AI using IP and fridging keywords, but as I sculpted longer and longer, it really did feel like mine. It really felt like mine when I had to transport it across town on the bus to find an oven to bake it, or when I cast them at 4 a.m. in the morning in a toilet block by wrapping an air compressor in a carpet to try to avoid waking up neighbors, or when I hand mixed every color and I customized all the swords. It felt like mine, and it really, really felt like mine when I would gift it to others and I would see their excitement. But you know, every single person I gave it to immediately recognized it as Nurgle. So what part of it was mine? So I've been working on an army, uh, a cultus of Nurgle project for Necromunda, hopefully eventually 40k. This army is pretty devoid of Games Workshop IP, but I still wanted to feel like it exists in that world. 
Why? why? Why would I? Why not make this for the plethora of other tabletop games? I think I make a lot of stuff because I love Warhammer. I want to be a part of Warhammer. Consciously, subconsciously, whatever. But I want to contribute my voice to something bigger that I already love. And you know, I met people in Nottingham that move there to try to get jobs at Games Workshop or just try to be closer to the thing they love. And despite knowing every bad reason, every rumor, every bad piece of history with that company, they still want to be closer, closer to the culture. And you know, I think I get it now. After 40 years of history, I think the thing that we all love belongs to us all in a way. Beyond the bounds of law, agreements, guidelines, Warhammer is the foundation of so many of the best developments in the miniature hobby. It's the reason why so many start their own companies, sculpt their own miniatures, design their own games, have reasons to meet new people and catch up with old friends. I think it belongs to the people that made it cool back when and the people that make it cool now. I think it belongs to the kid painting their first miniature and the people with 3D printed armies and the oldies playing defunct games and leakers and rumor mills, grand tournament winners and those who complain about changes on forums. Warhammer has always been about expression, whatever that means to you. And so I just think, you know, make a ruckus, make what you want to make, because you can.